Subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello everyone, my name is Christopher Black and welcome to this Q&A session from WHO headquarters here in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, I'm so happy to be joined today by one of our experts here, Dr. Sylvie Briand. Welcome Sylvie. Bienvenue. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell our audience a little bit about yourself. What do you do here at WHO? Okay, so I'm Dr. Sylvie Briand. I work at WHO on epidemic and pandemic diseases. I uh, currently am very busy with the COVID-19 disease. Uh, but uh, in the past, I also used to work on the influenza, influenza pandemic in particular in 2009, 2010. Excellent. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today because we've seen a lot of questions in social media, things, people coming to our websites, questions coming up from journalists and press conferences, um, asking about the similarities between this new coronavirus, COVID-19, and flu. And so we thought it would be a great time to talk a little bit about the similarities and the differences in these two diseases and um, so thank you for joining we're going to go a little we're going to unpack these two issues in the meantime if you want to ask a question to Sylvie Dr. Briand just put a question in the comment section of whatever platform you're watching is on and tell us where you're coming from tell us your name and tell us what's on your mind so thank you for joining so Dr. Briand um, when we talk about flu we're really meeting most times seasonal influenza. Can yeah. you tell our viewers, what is seasonal influenza? Well, at first, influenza is uh, due to a virus, uh, actually a family of viruses, and those viruses tend to circulate in human population of temperate climates. So that's why we see often epidemic of influenza during the winter season or cold season, depending where you live. And uh, it's a respiratory disease, so it gives you a uh, cough, runny nose, fever, um, uh, uh, muscle ache, and, um, um, and symptoms that are common to most of respiratory disease, basically. Uh, flu is something that many people take a little bit lightheartedly, in a way, but it's actually something that has profound impacts on countries and on, on families. It's something that can be quite, quite harmful, is that true? It's true, um, actually, because people get used to a seasonal flu epidemic, they feel that, uh, uh, well, it's, it's not very important and uh, because it's something they know. Uh, but actually, uh, flu um, tend to kill uh, between 250,000 to 650,000 people every year mm -hmm. on Earth. So it's a significant uh, amount. And some people are more likely to get severe disease and uh, if they don't get good treatment, they can uh, uh, die from it. And flu, influenza, we can protect people with a vaccine. That is yes, so there is a vaccine every year that is produced. Uh, it's a bit a tricky uh, disease because as you know, it's a family of viruses. So every year we need to look at what are the viruses circulating and we need to develop the vaccine to target those particular viruses. And this is why the composition of the vaccine changes every year. Thank you so much. So now, as many people know, and th something that a lot of people have been asking us questions on, we have a new coronavirus, and that's called COVID-19. So what are coronaviruses and what is this COVID-19? So coronaviruses are viruses. It's also a family of viruses. Mm -hmm. We have um, common coronaviruses, uh, four types, that are also circulating and sometimes at the same time as uh, flu viruses. And so uh, they also give some kind of common cold. But then we have other coronaviruses that are a bit different because those coronaviruses are uh, most of the time originated from animals. And so they are not exactly like human coronaviruses. They, they have uh, specificities that make them a little bit more dangerous. And we had the experience in 2003 with uh, SARS, uh, which emerged uh, in Asia. Uh, and then in 2012-13 with MERS, uh, which emerged in the Middle East. And this year we do have uh, COVID-19, uh, again, apparently has emerged also uh, in Asia. Okay, and it's a new virus to humans. It's a new virus, probably it, it, this virus was uh, circulating in animals. Uh, and then suddenly uh, it jumped to uh, one or two humans and, and started to spread from human to human. 
Thank you, Dr. Bion. So if you're joining us a little bit late, we're looking at um, similarities and differences between this new coronavirus, COVID-19, and flu or seasonal influenza. Um, you can, if you have any questions for Dr. Brion, um, put them in the comments section of whichever platform you're watching us on. And if you're watching us on Twitter, you can use the hashtag AskWHO. So I have a few questions for you myself, Dr. Brion. Is COVID-19 spread the same way as flu? So COVID-19 is a very new disease. Uh, and uh, so we are still investigating all the way uh, it can uh, be spread between people. But uh, from the initial observations we have seen in China, it seemed that flu and COVID-19 have the um, uh, same way of, of um, uh, transmitting. And these are two respiratory viruses. And so they transmit uh, when somebody uh, cough or sneeze uh, or speak. Uh, and it's transmitted by small uh, droplets of um, humidity that you have in your mouth and it goes to the other person. But uh, these droplets cannot uh, travel very far, so you need to be very close to people uh, to uh, get infected. Those droplets as well can uh, drop <laughs> on some surfaces. And if somebody comes and touch the surfaces uh, after you have um, spoken or, or cough, uh, uh, then this person uh, touches the surfaces with the hand and uh, then the hand is uh, contaminated and then if this person touches the face or the mouth or the nose with a contaminated hand, the person can get the virus. Okay. So with influenza, we have a vaccine to protect ourselves. With COVID-19, we don't currently have a vaccine. So how can people protect themselves from COVID-19? So actually the measure to protect yourself for both viruses are, are, are similar because uh, uh, we recommend therefore to um, uh, protect uh, yourself by washing your hands very regularly uh, because then it, you cannot, uh, if your hands are um, contaminated, you will not uh, put your, the virus in your eyes, your mouth or your nose. Uh, we recommend also when somebody is um, uh, showing respiratory symptoms, coughing, sneezing, uh, to stay home and to uh, rest until they recover. And if you see somebody uh, showing symptoms, it's better to stay one meter away so that you are not getting the virus uh, through, uh, through droplets. Um, also, what is important for people who are, are sick, uh, they can also protect the other by wearing a mask. Uh, but again, the best uh, way to protect the others is also to stay at uh, home and try to uh, not be in contact with the other or at least more than one meter so that you don't uh, transmit the virus. So this is something we're seeing a lot of questions about. When do, should I wear a mask or when should I not wear a mask? So if I understand you correctly, you're saying if I'm sick, I should be wearing a mask to help to protect the people around me. That's the general rule? Yeah, I think we, we can say it's the general rule. I think it's not necessary for everybody to wear a mask for two reasons. Uh, first reason, because we don't have enough masks for everyone and, and we need to reserve those masks for the people who really need it. And the people who need it are the people who are really exposed to a very sick patient. And this is the healthcare workers, the nurses, the doctors, and all the people working closely with uh, patients. Uh, and secondly, because sometimes when you wear a mask, uh, first, if you wear it for many hours, you will see it's not very comfortable and you tend to do mistakes. And instead of being more cautious, uh, you tend to forget that uh, what is most important is to have uh, a clean hands, uh, because even with a mask, you can still touch your eyes and, and still get uh, the contamination through the eyes. So it's better to just be aware, wash your hands frequently, and uh, you will be better protected than um, badly wearing a mask, basically. Thank you so much, Dr. Briot. So we're, my, we're getting so many questions from everyone here. Thank you so much for your questions and your enthusiasm on this. We will try to get to as many as we can in the time we have. And I'm from, originally from Canada, so I'm going to take the first question from Canada. Uh, from Patricia Compton from Alberta is asking, is COVID-19 only a winter virus? And that way, will it disappear once the warm weather comes, which in Alberta is sometime in July. But um, so, is it a warm, is it a cold winter, cold weather virus, COVID-19? This is something we don't know yet. We really don't know because um, because we are still in uh, winter in many places of the world where we have seen the virus. 
uh, what w some studies have been done on with on COVID-19 in laboratory, mm -hmm. uh, we we try now to investigate what are the elements uh, in the climate, the humidity, the heat, and so on that can uh, uh, influence the survival of the virus. But uh, we need uh, uh, to see what will happen in summer. What happens usually with respiratory viruses in summer is that people tend to go more outside and um, uh, houses tend to be more ventilated because it's uh, uh, hot. Mm -hmm. And so uh, probably uh, this helps to reduce the transmission of respiratory viruses. So something you mentioned there brings a bell to me is that we just have to re also remember that this COVID-19 is a new virus, so we're learning more about it every day, yeah. whereas influenza is something that we've been studying, we've been learning about it for many, many years. Yeah. So that's another similarity and difference mm. between the two. Um, so we have a question from, um, in terms of, uh, that one we got to, uh, how to prevent COVID-19 from getting to countries. So we have a question from David Muanda, who's in, asking about African countries specifically. Um, are there any countries that are safe from COVID-19 transmission or arriving to their country? Ha. I think, good question, David. yeah, it's, it's a good question, really. Um, uh, I hope that many countries will be safe from COVID-19 when we have been able to contain the virus where it is currently. Uh, and this is why we encourage countries to put in place uh, uh, strong measures now so that it can stop, we can stop the transmission now. Uh, but um, if it doesn't work, <laughs> uh, then the virus may continue to travel and to travel to other places. Um, currently, what we have seen is that um, uh, the, the virus has traveled with travelers, uh, but at the same time, it's very hard to uh, stop all the travel on Earth because uh, movement is part of life. And if you stop movement, uh, uh, then our lives will be very different and, and we may suffer a lot more from, from this than from the disease itself. So uh, currently what is really difficult is to find the right balance between maintaining a normal life and protecting people. And we are looking at all the options that are available to maintain this balance right. So something you mentioned there about containing COVID-19, mm -hmm. we don't contain influenza, is that right? Is that another difference? Or, and why is that? Yeah, it's very difficult to contain influenza for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that uh, some people may, uh, with influenza, infected with influenza viruses don't show symptoms and will transmit the disease even if they don't feel sick. So they won't stay at home because they are fine. And so they will come and meet with friends and families and, and transmit the virus. So very hard to um, uh, stop the virus in those conditions. Um, the, the other situation is as well that um, um, influenza uh, generates immunity. And, and so those viruses, uh, it's a big family of viruses. They are always somehow circulating. So uh, we would tend to uh, uh, let them circulate, uh, but protect the people who are most at risk to do severe disease. And this is a strategy that is slightly different than for COVID-19. Thank you so much, Dr. Briand. So we're getting lots of questions about travel. This is really yeah. on people's minds. Um, so people are asking really simple questions like, should I be traveling now? So you, you mentioned this a little bit, but let's say I, I, people do travel. We have Lola Ramos saying that she's just returned. Oops. She's just returned from France to the United States and she's worried, should she stay at home? Should she go visit people? What would your advice to people be who, who have been traveling, who haven't, as far as we know, come into contact with people who are sick with COVID-19? Yeah. So currently in the world, we have many different epidemics, uh, some epidemic in times of size and intensity. Mm -hmm. Some countries, they have just sporadic cases. So I think if you have visited those countries, your risk is extremely low. And so uh, you shouldn't be afraid and you should just go home and, and just uh, 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 monitor your health. And if you feel bad and sick, you stay mm -hmm. home and you seek for medical advice. Mm -hmm. uh, but other people will travel to countries where there is already kind of intense transmission. And there are not so many countries actually currently. So, um, and so if you have visited those countries, then you may be a little bit more cautious when you come back because you may pay more attention to your uh, fever and, and check it maybe once a, or twice a day just to make sure that uh, you are still safe and do it for 14 days, for example. Excellent. 
So in terms of where people can get more information, WHO's website is, is, is a good yep. so, source for, for global information, mm -hmm. for more specific information. If you're in other countries, their, their National Health Service would be a good, uh, good place to start, the Ministry of Health. or, For example, in the U.S. we've got CDC, in the yep. England we've got NHS. Where else can people get information on Yeah, I think many countries now are, are not only providing uh, information through their technical agency, uh, and this is often uh, complex information, I would say, uh, very detailed. Uh, but you have also hotlines in many countries where you can call and get uh, rapid advice. Um, and uh, you can check on many websites. I think now there is a lot of, of advice. And, uh, uh, and, and so I think there are plenty of, of sources. We have also developed um, a, a page called EpiWin, mm -hmm. uh, where you can find a specific advice if you are an employer mm -hmm. and you want to protect your employee, or if you are a faith-based organization and you want to uh, uh, undertake safe uh, gatherings, uh, etc. So okay. different. Can you find that from going from the WHO site, or is it a separate? Uh uh, no, it's linked to WHO. So www.who.int, and we have information in, in all of our six languages and some other languages yes. been developed. The more, the better on that. So going back to the travel in a way, um, I have a question from Parima, and she's asking, in terms of COVID-19, how does the disease start, and do people get symptoms all at the all the symptoms at the same time? So there's fever, there's cough, hard to mm. breathe. Does that, everything happen at the same time, or is it? Do we know is it different in each person or different in different situations? Uh, so um, actually, it depends on the people. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have uh, a triad that is um, uh, so the, the order of the symptom de may depend. But uh, people who uh, uh, show uh, symptoms may have uh, rapidly the three symptoms. So it's a, a fever, uh, and sometimes the fever come after uh, the cough, mm -hmm. uh, dry cough and shorten, shortness of breath, which shows that your, um, um, so that your um, pulmon, pulmon? Mm -hmm. your lungs, uh, your lungs, sorry, uh, your lungs are, are uh, infected. So uh, these are three symptoms. But then you have other symptoms like uh, some um, in 4% of the case, people are vomiting, uh, uh, sometimes they have diarrhea, but these are really uncommon symptoms. So I think, uh, and fatigue, of course, but fatigue is really common to any viral infection. So, uh, And it's hard to give advice to individuals in many different situations, but generally people should seek medical advice if they have any of these symptoms or all of these symptoms? Yeah, so you need to do your own risk assessment. If you have traveled to a place where there is intense transmission of the disease, of course you are more likely to get COVID-19 than flu or other respiratory viruses. So in this case, of course you need to pay attention to those symptoms. And if you have any doubt that you might have COVID-19, call your general practitioner or some hotline to get advice on how to behave and where to seek uh, medical attention. And, uh, and I think, and don't uh, panic or stress because uh, most of the cases of COVID-19 are mild, uh, more than 80%. And even now with uh, the large epidemic we have seen in China, 96% or more of the people will recover from the disease. Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, so if you're joining us uh, in the middle of our show here, this is a question and answer session with Dr. Sylvie Brion, and we're coming to you live from WHO headquarters in Geneva. Um, you can ask your questions in the comment box, depending on which platform you're watching us on. And if you're on Twitter, it's hashtag AskWHO. Um, we have a question from Teresa Iwa, and she's asking, what age groups are more likely to be affected by COVID-19? And I'm going to add a little bit onto that. And is that, I'm going to say, is that also different for influenza? Yeah. So apparently, uh, from the data we got from the first affected countries, um, the, the medium age, I mean, the, is around the 50s. And so the most affected people is above 40, up to uh, very uh, old uh, people, uh, more than 80 years old. And, um, and, and the young adults or the children are less affected. Also, uh, what we have seen uh, up to now is that uh, really the people will have more severe form of the disease, which uh, will require hospitalization, also uh, people at an older age, or people with underlying conditions such as uh, hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, 
uh, or any other immunodeficiency. Um, on the contrary, for COVID-19, we see very few children uh, with the disease, and most of the children have very mild disease. So this is very different from flu, because in flu, we see uh, both uh, end of the age uh, of the life course affected the very young kids and the elderly are often uh, uh, more affected by the disease and they do very severe form of the disease as well. And in flu as well, we see that pregnant women are more at risk of severe disease and their uh, baby as well. Uh, while uh, so far we have not seen this with COVID-19. Thank you. Um, so we have an question, interesting question from Mary Caldez, and I'm sure this is something that a lot of people are sensing, a lot of people are feeling. She says she's scared of COVID-19. Should we be scared? And could you give some advice to Mary to, uh, to help her work through this, these feelings? Yeah. I think it's normal to fear uh, this disease because it's a new disease. Mm. And frankly, uh, we know still, we know more than we knew uh, two months ago, but there are still a lot of unknown about the disease. Uh, but as time goes by, we know more and more, and our advice are more and more accurate, I think. And so, um, but what is interesting is uh, to know that it's, it's a respiratory virus. So it's not the first one we have seen in the history of humanity, and uh, it probably will not be the last one either. Mm -hmm. And so I think precautionary measure we use for any respiratory viruses that are transmitted from human to human are valid for this disease. And so I think if people uh, apply those measures uh, conscientiously and help their family and their neighbor and their friend to apply similar measures, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, many people will be protected. And what is very important, I think it's a way of greeting people mm. uh, because uh, we need to change something about uh, uh, how we do it. For example, shaking hands is a bit dangerous nowadays, uh, but then you can invent new ways of greeting that can show your uh, love or your friendship to others, but at the same time, uh, make sure that you are protected against respiratory viruses. Thank you, doctor. Um, we're getting quite a few questions about uh, commuting and public transport systems. Um, here in Europe, it's the end of the working day. People are heading home on the bus. I'm sure some people are watching us online mm -hmm. um, from trains and other things as they're going home from work or going to work in other parts of the world. What advice do you have for, tra for, for say, daily travelers who yeah. are traveling often in maybe cramped conditions yeah. and sometime in, win in the winter months? Yeah. I think when, when you are in a, a country where there is intense transmission, uh, health authorities have already pro provided guidance on that and how to reduce the uh, density of population, I would say, in public transport or in uh, uh, big uh, uh, mass gathering uh, events and so on. Um, what I think it's, it's, there are two folds of this. We need first people who are, again, uh, who show respiratory symptoms, stay home and if possible, do teleworking while you have symptoms. Maybe it's not COVID-19, it's just a seasonal flu or other respiratory uh, disease, but still, it's better f to protect uh, uh, yourself and the others to stay home and rest while you have those symptoms. For the people who are obliged to take public transport, again, wash your hands uh, repeatedly, uh, because this is uh, most likely to happen through your hands uh, in, in, even in this type of, of setting. And, uh, and watch your health, uh, and if you see symptoms, uh, again, uh, stay home and rest. Thank you, and thank you for everyone who had that question. Um, let's, we're getting quite a few people asking um, about vaccines. Mm -hmm. Do we know when a vaccine will be available for COVID-19, for example? So currently, there are many uh, research groups in the world who are developing what we call candidate vaccine. So it's a, it's a product that seems to have uh, the right efficacy, uh, but it's just the first phase of the development of a vaccine. Uh, because once you have a, a candidate vaccine, then you need to test uh, this vaccine for its safety, making sure that the vaccine will not produce adverse effects that are not desirable. 
And once you have the safety, then you have to test it also to make sure that indeed it protects really against the disease uh, enough at least to be distributed uh, largely. And you need also to make sure that certain specific groups like pregnant women or young kids can also receive the vaccine. So there are a number of stage in the vaccine development and uh, distribution that needs to be observed to make sure that once we have this product, it's really a good product that will make a difference. So in the meantime, that's why we need to uh, observe precautionary measures that will still protect most of us uh, in a very efficient way. And I think we'll take the chance to repeat those precautionary measures. So how can people best protect themselves against COVID-19? Okay, so um, please wash your hands repeatedly uh, during the day. Uh, uh, second, if you are sick, um, uh, protect your, the others by staying home. Uh, if you have cough or uh, runny nose, um, uh, if you have cough, do it in your elbow also to protect the others. Uh, runny nose, uh, use a tissue and dispose the tissue in a closed um, um, uh, dustbin. Um, and um, uh, rest as much as you can. And uh, if you are sick, stay home. Thank you so much. Um, Let's see what else. We're, we're getting near the end of this, unfortunately. So, but I've got so many questions, I don't even know where to start. Um, let's see. Here's a good one. Mina Brajovic, I'm trying, is, is it possible to be reinfected with the coronavirus? So if you've had it once, mild symptoms, and you've, you know, time has gone on, you've recovered, can you catch it again? So, um, so this is a good question because um, uh, many uh, researchers are currently looking at it and trying to understand uh, if people can be reinfected. Uh, what is true is that some people uh, who had the disease tested negative, uh, were discharged from hospital, and a few days later, when they are tested again, they test positive. And we don't know if this is due to the, uh, the test uh, that's because the test detect um, only uh, dead viruses because it's a specific test that um, uh, or, or if the virus is still there and alive and people have been reinfected. So this is the first question and we are working on it. Now the second part of your question is that um, uh, if I am infected will I develop antibodies so that I cannot do the disease again. So again, this is an important question that researchers are really uh, looking at it right now. Uh, we are just developing the, the tests that allow us to uh, see how many antibodies you have in your body. So it's called serology. So when we have those tests, we will be able to um, uh, look at uh, really uh, the people who are sick, how many antibodies they have and, and does this protect for further disease. But what we have seen in, 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 in China, and, and Chinese doctors have, have already um, mentioned it, is that if you use the plasma of um, um, convalescent people and inject it in, in uh, people who are sick, it seemed that uh, it helped them to recover. Mm -hmm. So it's very likely that we develop antibodies, and those antibodies can protect also others uh, from uh, the, the disease and probably protect ourselves from getting reinfected. But these are still uh, very early stage of the discovery and, and we need more data to uh, affirm that we are really protected. Thank you, Doctor. So again, if you're joining us a little bit late, we've been talking a bit about COVID-19 and influenza or flu. Mm -hmm. We're looking at their similarities and their differences. I'm wondering if you could just sum up one last time for our viewers, if people join us a little bit late, the main things that you want them to remember between COVID-19 and, and flu influenza. or influenza. Okay. Um, so the two diseases are due to viruses. These are respiratory viruses. They are transmitted by droplets. When you speak, you cough, you sneeze. Uh, they are also can be transmitted by uh, when you touch surfaces. So that's why to protect yourself, you need to wash your hands. You need to uh, cough in your elbow, um, sneeze in the tissue and uh, dispose safely the tissue. And if you are sick, uh, stay at home isolate yourself and if uh, you need to protect better the other wear a mask and uh, and rest and and try to take it uh, uh, with a lot of um, serenity because again as i said 80% uh, of the cases are mild 
and uh, 90, more than 96% of people will recover from this disease, COVID-19. And for flu, um, if you are um, in the at-risk group, please get vaccinated before the flu season because the vaccine protects you. And for flu, if you are sick, we also have antiviral treatment that can treat you. So uh, there is a lot of hope in modern medicine. So don't be too um, fearful and, um, and just let's fight this disease together. I think that's a really important message. Thank you so much, Dr. Briand.